Thank you, Dr. Adelsheim, and thank you to uh, the Kaminar organizers. Uh, this is a very special event. I'm very impressed, not only with uh, the esteemed colleagues that I'm, uh, I've had the privilege to speak with tonight, but also all of you and your compassion, your passion for um, working um, to reduce stigma and to also um, inform yourselves about. Uh, the research, the latest research in uh, mental health. So today I'm going to be talking to you about risk for and resilience from developing mood disorders, specifically in children. These are my faculty disclosures, just to mention that I do get uh, receive funding from the National Institute of Mental Health and the Stanford uh, Child Health Research uh, Institute. I'd like to start by just introducing to you, for most of this talk, I'm going to be generalizing to mood spectrum disorders. In children, I call it developmental mush, because so many children are yet to be declared in terms of what kinds of specific mood symptoms they have, and they change as their brain develops. And so what you'll hear me talk about are um, a collection of mood syndromes, including depression, where children experience sustained periods of sadness accompanied by difficulties with sleep, lack of interest, guilt, low energy, concentration difficulties, appetite changes, and possibly uh, weight changes, changes in the way that they uh, actively walk around, um, and, and possibly, and most sobering of all, uh, expressing thoughts uh, and potentially planning suicide. The other end of the spectrum, um, and certainly it's unclear, too, whether these disorders really fall on a continuum or represent distinct entities in childhood, um, is, the, is the bipolar spectrum. And uh, that can include, uh, in children, uh, elevated, uh, sustained periods of elevated mood, euphoria, or potentially irritability, as well as uh, uh, accompanying symptoms like increase in goal-directed activity, distractibility, uh, grandiosity, or feelings of, um, of uh, power, powerfulness, um, flight of ideas, and other cognitive uh, issues that accompany manic depression. So why do children get sad? And that's really addressing this central question of what are the mechanisms of mood disorders? Lots of people are sad for very specific reasons. Lots of people are sad for no reason at all. And somewhere down the highway of life, some of them get better and their depression or their um, manic symptoms are undone. And others continue to have symptoms recur down the line. And there's a, certainly a, a subset of individuals who are sad and just don't want to analyze it. The sobering consequences of mood disorders in individuals um, gives us some pause, uh, particularly not just from the perspective of reducing stigma, but imagine, if you will, it's one in 40,000 individuals, Americans, die by suicide each year. So that means by the end of this presentation, we'll have lost one American um, to, to suicide. And this is a significant problem we're facing not just nationally, internationally, globally. The World Health Organization talks about how depression and mood disorders are going to increasingly become the leading cause of dysfunction for many individuals um, around the world. We're facing this crisis regionally and locally. We've had a cluster, a suicide cluster, unfortunately, in, our, um, in the peninsula recently. And we're struggling as a community, uh, as practitioners, on how to address this issue directly. Today I want to talk to you also about the fact that we have a number of treatments. The good news is, is that we've done a lot of research to understand um, whether uh, treatments um, work for children and adolescents. And in fact, there are effective treatments for mood disorders in kids. Most individuals who suffer from depression or bipolar disorder on average wait 10 to 15 years before they get a diagnosis. And you can imagine what that lag does to 
the potential progression of mood symptoms down the line and how difficult it can be to eventually treat them effectively. So why not start in childhood? Well, a lot of people have debated whether we're over-medicating children and whether we're using the right treatments. Are the treatments that we normally use for adults appropriate for children and adolescents? And I think we do need to think very carefully about the medications and uh, psychotherapeutic interventions that we use in children and adolescents. Be careful to adapt them, to developmentally appropriately adapt them so that children and adolescents can benefit from them the most and also not e experience the untoward side effects. The point that I want to make here is that we are, uh, as a field, I think we're, we sometimes uh, underestimate the progress we've made. <laughs> And I think that we can absolutely rely on very useful medications as well as psychotherapies that um, can be uh, implemented in ch ch uh, children and adolescents very effectively. And in fact, with the advent of brain imaging technology, we've, we're also beginning to understand the potential brain effects of a variety of different interventions. So today I would just like to highlight um, a couple of those as well as some of the work that we're doing. This study was published a couple of years ago, um, examined about 20 adolescents with depression, and they were presented with a face emotion task uh, where a variety of different emotions were presented to them in the MRI or magnetic resonance imaging scanner um, before and eight weeks after treatment with Prozac. And then there, Brain patterns were compared to typically developing healthy children who didn't have any symptoms of depression. And what they found um, in this study was that eight weeks of treatment normalized most regions of increased activation or hyperactivity that are known to be associated with adolescent depression. What are those brain centers that govern or organize around mood problems or mood symptoms? Well, there's clearly some, um, there's clearly a lot of data that now suggests there's um, two major areas of the brain that are involved in mood symptoms. Um, we call them um, mood centers of the brain, in, in, including the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system, um, which includes um, the amygdala. The prefrontal cortex develops more in adolescence. It takes its time. And it governs the area of the, it's part of the brain that uh, governs executive functions, the most sophisticated functions that we have in the brain, the ones that are involved in planning and organization. This area of the brain is also very important for regulating emotion. The more primitive area of the brain, the one that develops probably first um, through the course of child development and very early on, and I can certainly attest to that because I have toddlers at home who very nicely exercise their limbic system on a day-to-day -day basis when they have temper tantrums, is this area of the limbic system that includes um, regions such as the amygdala. Uh, it controls, it expresses emotion, it's important for learning as well. Why did it develop first? Well, because it's critical for survival uh, of, um, of the human um, uh, existence. It's, it's important for fight or flight reactions. So we've now also developed some fairly sophisticated ways of understanding this complex, one of the most complex organs of our body, the brain. And what we've learned is that the brain network maps are different in individuals with mood disorders. Here's an example of a healthy brain. It's composed of highly interconnected hubs, kind of like major cities in this country that are connected by highways. And so those major cities like San Francisco and New York are connected by major highways, Highway 80 or 90, and those Hubs, as well as those highways in between them, are very important for us to understand how depression might work. We did a study a couple of years ago that shows you how the networks of the brain, or the hubs of the brain, 
are distributed in individuals who are typically developing, who don't have any mood symptoms at all, and compared those to those who do have experienced mood symptoms. And what we found um, was that the individuals who have mood disorders, in, highlighted here in blue, show more networks in the limbic areas of the brain, those more primitive lower parts of the brain. Individuals who don't have mood disorders tend to have more sophisticated, well-developed networks in higher prefrontal parts of the brain. The other aspect that we've been able to uh, develop some understanding on is how, does certain, how do certain areas of the brain shape themselves over the course of development? And we were very excited with our um, imaging techniques that we developed at Stanford to demonstrate that it's not only true that children with mood disorders have smaller amygdalas, smaller limbic system regions, but their amygdalas are misshapen. Here's the, a picture of a very smooth surfaced, smooth contoured amygdala. And here is a picture of an amygdala of an individual with, um, with bipolar disorder, a child with bipolar disorder. It's showing a lot of, as you can see, kind of like concentric rings, like Saturn-like rings around the amygdala. And those are the regions that are misshapen. So we're already beginning to identify not just symptoms in children, mood symptoms in children, but also potentially areas of the brain that may not be functioning or uh, shaping properly over the course of development. Can we use that information to determine who has a mood disorder? We're far yet from developing using neuroimaging as a diagnostic tool. We're using it right now to help us understand the underlying mechanism of mood disorders. How do mood disorders happen and why do they happen in children? And do we have a brain-based understanding of that? And I wish I could say, you know, that I could distinguish one or the other of a child. You know, sometimes we can tell by the symptoms they express, but as uh, um, other speakers have already mentioned, Many people are very, very withdrawn when they have symptoms and don't want to talk about the symptoms that they experience. And we've also learned that even amongst all of the potential factors that might be contributing to the development of mood disorders, whether it's other psychiatric conditions like ADHD, cognitive vulnerabilities, environmental factors, stress at home, stress at school, stress with friends, brain abnormalities that we've identified. It's family history that's the clearest risk factor for developing a major mood disorder. We were very curious about that and thought, well, if, if we can identify children of parents with mood disorders, either bipolar disorder or depression, and study them as early as possible, possibly even before they develop mood symptoms, is there a way for us to use that information to inform treatment later down the line. And what we've found in our research so far is that some children at high risk for mood disorder show brain patterns of vulnerability. Here's a picture of a low risk brain, a brain of a child who doesn't have any family history of any mood disorders or any other psychiatric disorder. There's no activation issues, no functional problems. Here's a high risk a brain, a brain of a child, a group of children on average um, who have parents with uh, bipolar disorder. You can see that their prefrontal cortex, the area in yellow in this picture is overactive. It's almost as if it's needing to work harder to do what it's supposed to normally do. And those highways in between those major hubs in the prefrontal cortex and the limbic system, those highways are also impaired. The connectivities between the prefrontal cortex and the amygdala are also impaired. It's not just bad news. I've also discovered that some children at high risk for mood disorders seem to show brain patterns of resilience. 
Because these kids are all healthy, I couldn't distinguish one from another. It's the family history that distinguished them. At, be, at a behavioral level, they all look the same. They're all typically developing children so far. But their brains look very different. And in this situation, what we found is that those, some of those kids with a parent with bipolar disorder show actually increased connections between certain critical parts of the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the brain, and in particular, the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex and the brain network that's responsible for executive function. So here's a mood-regulating part of the prefrontal cortex connecting with the executive part of the, uh, the prefrontal cortex and doing so in a, in, in a strong manner, in a way that's very compellingly different than children who are typically developing who don't have any family history. Strikingly, those low-risk children are in, indicated here in blue, and the high-risk children are the ones indicated in green. You can see that this pattern is also, I see a glare so I can't see it very well um, on this slide, but um, the first slide talks about function, yes. <laughs> so with, it, uh, as, as, as the children increase in function, the high-risk kids show stronger connections in this area, but the low-risk kids don't show that increase in strength of connectivity. The second slide talks about how this happens with age, that as kids age over the course of um, 18 years, you'll see that um, between the ages of 8 and 18, the, the older kids seem to have stronger connections, which reinforces the idea that if we did train kids earlier, if we did target these, these prefrontal areas earlier, we might be able to really give ourselves um, a, a lot of... Um, um, uh, uh, we might be able to actually make a difference in terms of their developmental trajectories. And finally, one of the last pieces of information that we've learned here is that girls and boys are different. And in fact, we've known this for, uh, for a long time, that girls may be more prone to mood and anxiety disorders and boys more to ADHD and other disruptive behavioral disorders, although we are also recognizing that we're underdiagnosing girls with ADHD. But in this particular analysis, what we found was that the girls were the ones that were more vulnerable um, in terms of their connectivities. They had lower relative connectivities compared to boys, and that was just true in the high-risk cohort. Family chaos is another factor that we looked at in these families affected um, by bipolar disorder, we found that the more chaos there was, the more disconnected the brain networks were, were in their healthy offspring. The good news was that when we tried, when we tried a family therapy intervention, as children's moods improved over the course of a 12-week family-focused therapy, we found that their prefrontal function also improved. So family therapy can actually improve brain function. In the end, we have a whole host of factors that influence brain development. I haven't talked or scratched the surface of any of these individually, but our goal is eventually to take these vulnerabilities that may even be escalated by certain critical stressors, as common as puberty and as rare as sexual abuse, and try to find a way to intervene so that we can actually shape the trajectories more towards adaptive functioning rather than lifelong mood disorders. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll take questions later. Thank you.